education. Um, education is learning what you didn't even know you didn't know. Daniel J. Borstrom. This quote is something I feel everybody should take in more consideration, especially considering the fact that we live in this information age, where we can ask almost any question you could possibly imagine and get an answer for. And in the midst of all of these questions that we ask, we typically only ask the questions to things we know we don't know. And that is something I have found extremely fascinating. Let's say you come across something and you get interested in maybe who the tallest person who ever lived was, or maybe what's going on in China. Maybe you want to learn French, and you get all these little things in life that kind of like hint you towards actually learning about something that you never even thought about within itself, but you kind of realize you don't know about it, and thus you get curious. So what I have done is actually invested a lot of my own personal time investigating these questions and understanding how do you actually approach trying to find out this information, find out the questions you never thought about asking because you don't know what you don't know. I come from a really tiny place, a small town up in northern Maine, really isolated and there's not a lot going on. And what I have always found is that when there is something going on, it's from elsewhere. So how do I learn about it? I, I get news. I, I have to have all this information come in and that's how I get interested in stuff. And it always found me I always found myself in a position where everything that I ever want, like whenever something comes up, then I get interested in it. If there's current events, then I'm looking into it. And when it comes to fun facts, I find myself like interested in wanting to know what other people don't. Because there's so much information that comes in, and especially having access to things like the internet, allows people like me in these isolated regions of the world and the United States to actually have access to all of this information that I would have otherwise had to been relying on other people giving to me. So, in the process of this, I got involved on YouTube. I created a YouTube channel that is called Think Fact, and I ended up starting to investigate questions that people were, were not really thinking about. And in the process of this, I managed to accumulate over 100,000 people who watch my content, which is unbelievable. I never would have thought some small town kid who's just got a bunch of questions about things nobody's really thinking about would be able to find so many people from around the world who'd be interested in the same exact stuff and the same exact questions. So what I ended up doing was creating a small video series at first, kind of like looking at just random facts, just small stuff, like, like things that people might not necessarily be asking, but it's convenient to have a video over. Like maybe what is the largest heritage group in the United States? Um, what words don't have things rhyming with them? So, simple little stuff. But it ended up becoming much more complex as time went on and in a way that I never actually expected it to. Um, what eventually ended up happening was is I found myself revolving around a word that I said in my first video, and it's this. This is my first video, <laughs> yeah, Babyface Dale. Um, it's, it's only like two years ago, though. So, you know, so, uh, uh, um, so I said this word context is the key to knowing the truth. And I had no idea how serious I would take that statement, how serious I would take this word context in terms of trying to take complex things that you get at face value and trying to deconstruct it and find ways to think about it that no one else necessarily has been thinking about it. And it's absolutely fascinating to like, say like you get like a, like a simple statement, like, what is a fruit? Okay, so this is where it kind of got started was something kind of silly, something broad. And I don't know if you remember back, back in 2005, like that early mid 2000s where everyone's like, did you know that tomatoes are a fruit? And you're like, what, what, no. And you're like, does that make ketchup a smoothie? Like, what is it? What's uh, destroying my sense of reality here? So I ended up taking a question like that and wanting to dive into it. And I found out there was so much more to it. So I made this video called We Are Berries Too. It's like, what is and is not a berry? And I found out that there is a whole massive scope to understanding what a fruit is. A fruit has things like simple, single fruit, multiple fruit, and aggregate fruit. Things like, it's just this diverse thing. And I'm like, what, what? aggregate fruit? What is that? And I end up looking more into it. And I'm like, aggregate fruits are things that have multiple ovaries form in a single flower. And a single fruit is a single ovary form in a flower. And berries come from single fruit. So I found out that tomatoes are berries, bananas are berries, pumpkins are berries, oranges are berries, watermelon are berries. That means the biggest fruit in the entire world, pumpkins, which can grow up to the size of a car, are the biggest fruit. And I wouldn't think of a berry as being the biggest fruit, something that you can actually base such a question like that off of. And that's what was kind of fun about actually researching stuff like this, is be able to find that there was a whole big level to this that you don't really see at the surface by trying to dive into the context. So my next thing was this. I took a big question, and what I looked at was humanity. So I am an anthropology major, and I'm absolutely fascinated by humanity. And I looked at the question of population. We see this whole issue in the world with people's population growing immensely, and we see population growth. And I asked the question, 
are humans going extinct? You might see that and you might be like, no, there's, there's a population crisis. We want to start thinking about not having more people. But I end up finding populations of people around the world. These are native Tasmanians. They are from the island of Tasmania below Australia. And this whole ancestral group no longer exists. Their ancestors mixed in with the um, Europeans who ended up immigrating to the island forcefully. Um, and eventually what happened was is this whole ancestral group within itself ended up being depleted into another ancestral group and all of their culture, their language, their identity absorbed and almost pretty much gone. This is Truganini. And in asking this question, I found that she was the last Tasmanian, full-blood Tasmanian, and one of the last speakers of her language. Her, and I'm pretty sure I, it's her, or one of her relatives, were the last people to ever speak their language. Their whole culture died with them. And that's not something we really think about. And when you think of that on a broader scale, think about Native Americans being a subpopulation within a huge, massive population. There are about 500 um, or 50 million Native Americans in the Americas alone of a population of about a billion. And there's estimates that that kind of population could essentially be absorbed in the coming future. And how do we deal with things, especially with more threatened populations like Native Hawaiianers? That's something that not a lot of people think about. But I got thinking when you try to break down this context, so then I got thinking about human populations. I'm connecting with my audience now. I'm starting to get a bunch of people who are interested in what I'm doing, and I'm talking to them about these questions and trying to get their perspective on this stuff. And that's part of that's the like one of the biggest things about what I do. And I'm so like thankful to have this audience that is interested in these types of questions as well. So I looked at Mars. So you've heard in the news that people have been thinking about going to Mars, and that's actually really awesome. We need to get over there. Um, Buzz Aldrin's really saying we should, and I agree with him. Um, the man's been to the moon. How can you argue with a guy? Um, so anyway, <laughs> um, Mars is going to eventually probably have human settlements. And that is going to be a huge step. But when we think about human populations throughout history, what has happened? They go to a new place. They end up kind of getting a new cultural identity. And eventually, they see themselves as wanting to kind of have this home rule. Happen in the United States. Britain's like, hey, we want to keep you. And we're like, eh, not today. And yeah, that happened. And then you saw this whole thing over time where people eventually did want independence. And what that may end up happening, what that may end up doing, is we see places like Mars, where people will go to, and eventually they might want their own home rule, they might want independence, and that might reshape how we think of countries, not necessarily being sovereign states on the country or the, the planet Earth, but being planets, and thinking of countries as something at that scale, instead of just being like our planetary scale. And it's getting stuff like that, just trying to dive into this context, and you'll hear me say it a lot. So then I thought about words. English is probably, is one of, is the arguably most spoken language in terms of um, if you include um, people who learn it as a second language, third language, and so forth. And this means that English has become a global phenomenon. You get people all over the world contributing to language, speaking it, um, English, and so forth. And then I got wondering, who owns English? Like, who is the person who's getting to make all these new rules and everything? And so I can connect it to my audience. I have an audience about, of about, um, over all my views I've ever gotten, I've about, have had about 7 million people, or 7 million individual views have, like, for all my content. And out of that, about 25% of that is just Americans. About 40% of that is from countries where their first language is English. Meaning I have about 60% of my entire audience is coming from countries like India, G Germany, Sweden, Russia, um, Mexico, Brazil, Philippines. All of these countries where these people are not learning English as necessarily their first language. And it got me asking, who then who owns it? Is it England? Is it the dictionary people? Is it, who is, is it the MLA people? Who, who is at this power? And what we end up realizing is that with everybody contributing with this global language, it seems that everybody truly kind of has a bit of the stake. And we got talking more about it, trying to think about English as not something that's necessarily England, not trying to think of it as necessarily a, an American or any sort of entity, but think of it more as like a world language, because that's tr essentially what it's becoming as more people around the world learn it. And that got me to even deeper questions. So this is probably the hardest video ever made. And it's called, what did you experience before you were alive? And this is after you hear all these questions about like the afterlife. And people don't touch that with like a five mile stick. They're like, I'm not getting involved. That's religion. That's, mm. So I was like, OK, then let's try to think about something that you can get involved with sciences. You can think a bit more subjectively about. And there's not all this necessarily argument about. And I said, what did you experience before you were alive? So people were trying to dive into this, look into this. And I proposed a few things, like maybe you don't exist. You just you're, you form as a biological being, and there you go. What if consciousness is something that is very 
um, iffy. Like, let's say you teleport a person, and but that first body that you teleport doesn't necessarily get destroyed, and you have another person create, created. Well, your consciousness is not going to be in both of those bodies. How do you then assume that your consciousness is an exact product of your mental state, your brain? It might not be. How do you know when you go to bed, your consciousness doesn't get destroyed, and you wake up, and you're someone entirely new with all your old memories? So, I go, <laughs> 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 I'm just... <laughs> Getting a bit of a life crisis here, guys. Um, um, so, and it kind of got me thinking about like, these more questions, so I proposed this. And then I got this. So, going through an old crate, I proposed this question to my audience, and I, in the process of this, this is an actual picture of one of my relatives. I found this in an old crate. It was probably taken like, in the 1880s, had no name on it. I have no idea who this person is. I know he's related to me. I know that he impacted the people around him, and his, the, the people who were around him, like obviously I exist, so there's some extent that I, this guy is probably relevant somehow. Um, but what's fascinating about this is this person existed, but his, his legacy, everything about him is lost. I don't, nobody knows who he is, nobody knows what he is, but he has this legacy that is not necessarily attached to a name, that impacted people that impacted people, that doesn't necessarily exist in a sense that it's tied to him. Now, why are, how I propose this to people was, when you think about your ancestors, like let's say I tell you to think about your great-grandparents. There's about, you probably got about eight of them, if I'm thinking correctly. Not everybody really knows their great-grandparents, but how about you take that even a step further? Your, your great-grandparents is great-grandparents. That is 64 individuals, all of which were necessary for you to exist, and you probably don't know almost any of them. And that's just crazy to think that these people who are essential for your existence you don't know really much anything about. I found a single picture of one of my, my great-grandparents' great-grandparents, of a woman who was born in 1804, and she was well off to do, had a picture in the 1840s, and she, I have a bit of a face to a name and I can kind of attach it to. But I ended up talking to my audience and we, we came to this understanding that maybe that it's not about being remembered, but about the legacy you leave behind, about leaving behind these ideas and the way you think about things. That necessar not necessarily, it's about being remembered for what you do, but the positive things you leave behind. And that's something I've, been, I've really tried to get people thinking about as we kind of get scared about death, as we kind of think about these deep, deep issues and how to face them. So I proposed this and there was a massive discussion about it. By that time, my video was getting bigger and bigger. And then there was this. So there was a whole issue of like AI. If you heard AI, AI is kind of spooky and scary. People are kind of like not really knowing how to approach that because that, people are like, are they gonna take us over? So people are like, oh, let's just get rid of, let's not even think about AI right now, let's just be careful. I'm like, well, okay, then what if we put humans in computers? How do you do that? Other than AI, which you can probably feel not like so compassionate for, if you put a human in a computer, a human consciousness, are they gonna have human rights? Are they gonna have the capability to control a computer like a, a robot could? But now they're a human consciousness is inside a computer? How do you deal with something like that? How, nobody's really talking about that in this kind of extent. So when I think about AI, I thought about trying to break down this massive issue and try to find it from a different approach that could potentially bring together different problems that people aren't necessarily thinking about. And there was a huge discussion on this, people kind of contributing their own perspectives on this from different parts of the world, different things that they've read. And that gives me a whole perspective of things that I never was able to consider because I don't know what I don't know. And being able to talk to people from all around the world who have these different bits of knowledge and these different perspectives over it really helps this type of understanding grow. And this led me to this. So this was my most latest video. And I was initially going to do a topic just on this, but I found that that's a nightmare. So, um, to, um, especially considering how deep some of this stuff gets. I did a video about kind of like observing these trends that we see in the world around us. So we see that this whole global society is coming together. We see more people are speaking the same language. More people are getting access to the internet and being part of this global discussion. And that is absolutely fascinating, but what do you call that? Like, you see it, but what do you call it? Everybody around the world is kind of playing soccer. You see, like, these, these elements of individual cultures, individual societies, becoming these global things as we come together. And there's actually something for that, to explain that, and it's called Type 1 Civilizations, and it's called the Kardashev Scale. Kardashev being Nikolai Kardashev, a Russian, Russian astrophysicist. And he basically made a model that was meant for observing potentially um, life within the cosmos. So if we're like looking at somewhere, we can see very broad like, um, aspects that we could potentially say that's probably intelligent life. That's probably a planet with something on it that has energy, electricity. Like if something what is looking at Earth from a far away distance, they probably see electricity, something lights. We are a type zero civilization. We're kind of broken apart. We have all these different cultures. We kind of don't all connect. And 
what that means is we, with this giant connection that's coming forward, scientists have been able to use this model that was actually initially meant for energy consumption and able to put it and put more context and understand our own progression to try to understand what's going to get us to this type 1 civilization. And you've probably already seen stuff in culture on it. Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, that's type 1 civilizations. And there's more. There's type 2, which is like Star Trek, where you get this kind of stellar where people are able to actually harness energy from their sun. They have like this almost, um, they can kind of, they're traveling around to different planets. Um, type 3 would be like um, Star Wars. Star Wars is this, this huge galactic thing. And even though I didn't focus on those, it's kind of like recognizing that there is this progression and what about that can we kind of understand and apply to our own civilization, to understand our own progression. And it's basically trying to introduce ideas and terminology into the public domain, trying to get these ideas out by trying to dive into the context. And that's kind of the big thing about this. Having a global audience and being kind of the, the, a person who's trying to lead this charge, is, it's a big undertaking. But it's one I'm so thankful for. I've been able to meet so many wonderful people from around the world, and it's been life-changing. Um, one of the biggest things I've had the opportunity to do is try, like, actually connect with people and kind of lead a global discussion that I never would have thought I would have been able to do and present questions that people would have never considered because they don't know what they don't know. But by trying to take this simple word, context, and try to take deep, broad discussions and break them down, you're able to have a discussion over all of this stuff and think about things in a way you never would have thought about until someone kind of told you to think about things by breaking it down in a way you never would have thought about. And so when it comes to education, you, it's really about learning what you never knew you knew. And you can do that yourself and try to tackle these issues by introducing a little bit of context into the discussion and trying to break things down. And sometimes you might get a different perspective. All the videos that I've talked to you about all have different elements that related to one another. As I researched, a little question by breaking it down led to something else and led to something else. And that's how I created what I've done. And that's what I want to introduce to people. So when you think about an issue, don't take it at face value. Think about the context. You just might find something you never knew you knew. Thank you.